Hi everybody, we're here with the Black Aesthetic. Um, I'd like to introduce you to Ramalaika Imhotep, Leila Weefer, and Jamal Bat, the Black Aesthetic Collective. They've been collecting and showcasing rare independent or unknown films and shorts that they think should have a wider audience. And with each film viewing, there's been a guided audience discussion where technical, structural, and socio-political themes in the films are teased out. The goal has been to create a robust forum for people to exchange ideas, make connections, and experience the communal aspects of film. A feeling that many of us have felt removed from, aptly expressed by Jamal in his conclusion in the book where he speaks about the chosen loneliness of being a teenage black gay cinephile. Season three is in lots of ways a tract that signals the ending of many iterations of the black aesthetic. As Ra puts it, from two cousins to four friends to six homies to the now current three collaborators. The energy and gentle thinking that has gone into the book has been about how do we put something so beautiful and big and meaningful to bed quietly with enough covers and enough love that the world knows it existed and still exists and can be brought back to life if need be? Having been a part of many black political organizations in London in the 90s, I know too well that feeling of endings, of the sweetness of goodbyes, of the sadness of moving on, but still the necessity to have to do so. In the introductory essays to season three, each member of the Black Aesthetic has centered their voice on specific aspects of Black life, spirit, sweat, and the intimacy or the interior. While we are embedded in this phase of our lives as global citizens discerning interiors in all of their multitudinous forms, we invite you to join Jamal Batts, Leila Weefer, and Ra Malaika Imhotep from each of our interior spaces, internal, corporeal, and of the domicile across the states to bear witness to the Black Aesthetic mixtapes. And now I'll just give a brief introduction to each of the uh, members of the Black Aesthetic, and then we'll move on to the mixtapes. Leila Weaver, she, they, he, is a transgender non-conforming artist writer and curator based in Oakland, California. Their interdisciplinary practice examines the performativity intrinsic to systems of belonging present in our lived experiences. The work brings together concepts of the sensorial, memory, abject, hyper-surveillance and the erotic. WIFA has worked with local and national institutions including SF MoMA, the Wattis Institute, Berkeley Art Museum and Pacific Film Archive, and Smack Mellon in Ber Brooklyn, New York. Weefer is a lecturer at the University of California, Berkeley, and the San Francisco Art Institute. Jamal Batts is a writer, curator, and doctoral candidate in the Department of African American and African Diaspora Studies at UC Berkeley. His work explores blackness, queerness, contemporary art, and the intricacies of sexual risk and risk-taking. His writing has appeared in a catalogue for the New Museum's exhibit, Trigger, Gender as a Tool and a Weapon, Open Space, ASAP slash J, New Life Quarterly and SF MoMA's website in conjunction with their Modern Cinema series. He is a 2020 Robert Rauschenberg Foundation Scholar in Residence, the recipient of an LGBTQ research, research fellowship from the One National Lesbian and Gay Archives and a member of the curatorial collective, The Black Aesthetic. 
Ramalika Imhotep is a black feminist writer and performance artist from Atlanta, Georgia, currently pursuing a doctoral degree in African diaspora studies at the University of California, Berkeley. Her creative and intellectual work tends to the relationships between black femininity, vernacular aesthetics, and the performance of labor in the dirty South. She is co-convener of the Church of Black Feminist Thought, an embodied spiritual political education project and a member of the curatorial collective, The Black Aesthetic. She was an Omi Arts Creative Arts Practice Artist in Residence at Ashara Ekandayo Gallery and a Damley Fellow at the Cleveland Museum of Art. Recently, she was awarded the 2019 Tony Beauchamp Prize in Critical Art Writing by Gulf Coast Literary Magazine. In the introduction to the book, I quote from artist Abigail Deville, who in 2018 said, nobody knows what black people have contributed to the history of society. And yet I say everybody knows. Black lives, black aesthetics, black troubles, black stillness, black joy, black study, black silence, black movement, black matter, black sounds, black woes. Black noise, blackography. Welcome to Black Interiors. In today's mixtapes, Jamal and Layla and Ramalaika will be showing cuts from films previously shown at venues throughout the Bay Area, and in true mixtape fashion, we'll be bringing you back and forth with no slack in true Cool Herc style. Thank you and enjoy. Thank you, ma'am. Thanks. Thank you so much. Thank you. Excited to see what's happening next. So where are we going to start? Should we go with uh, Ra? Are you ready to, <laughs> ready to go first? Yeah. Why not? You know, why not? <laughs> Wait, before I go, can I read your bio, Nan? Oh, yeah, if you want to, sure. That's sweet of you. I don't want to read about myself. That's that would be too egotistical. <laughs> but it's so fitting. Um, so Nan has been like our wonderful editor for this season, um, and I'll read her bio now. Think of Nan Collymore's work as a gilded cloak that you wear sometimes. That you wear. Sometimes you're reading an essay or hanging a garment. Sometimes you're listening to a conversation. Her work is about the labor of love and the touch and the meaning that we move through when we are posing a question or troubling an idea. She uses her hands to compose thoughts through words, pictures, and objects. She believes in magic and the sacred and conjures from the heart. She is often working with remaking and reforming materiality into visual projects or palimpsests to reframe a conversation on the interwovenness of subjectivity. Wow, that is a beautiful bio. <laughs> and we're so grateful that you held um, our collective work as part of your inspiring conjure practice. So thank you. Thank you. I'm grateful to have done it. It's been a really great project. It's been really wonderful working with you three and with Wolfman and with all the, you know, fantastic contributors that we had. It's a beautiful book. Lord knows, man. It took so much magic. <laughs> <laughs> and a bunch of weaving. So we had the right editor here. No you know? weaving. Ooh, some work. Right. Yes. <laughs> it's worth it, though. Bear with me as I share my screen. So this first clip comes from um, the best Lomax film, Georgia Sea Island Singers, that we showed as part of our Black Interior Spirit programming, which was the first in a series of screenings we hosted um, at the Berkeley Art Museum and Pacific Film Archives in collaboration with their Out of the Vault um, initiative. So big shout out to Kathy Garrett for like being our point person there. Um, and like opening us up to a bunch of really amazing archival work. I um, mean, we went into their collection and searched for 
for black images, black representations, black film. Um, and while um, we knew that there wouldn't be a lot, there was certainly an abundance. Um, and so this is, as I scroll to find my place, um, this is a glimpse at our spirit offering. If we believe that Black spirit evades capture, how do we reconcile a series of films that purport to show Black culture and Black praise? A ring shout filmed inside the sterile Blackness of a soundstage is a queer thing. I recently discovered Black folk singer, songwriter, and just like amazing human Toshi Regan's rendition of the Gullah Geechee hymn, Yonder Come Day. And in the layering of her singular Black queer voice, I am taken back to the ring shout, leading me to make the essentialist claim that Black folks are always about the business of making God sound like themselves. While we first interpreted the name of the film, Georgia Sea Island Singers, as a generic description of the group, the Georgia Sea Island Singers were, in fact, a traveling folk music ensemble with the shifting roster of performers. Does the fact that this ensemble knew themselves to be performers and were familiar with the anthropological gaze and capture of both ethnomusicologist Alan Lomax and his folklore sister Bess make the picture less sacred? As we watch the beautifully lit troupe of Black elders and Georgia Sea Island singers stomp and clap and sing and play, their skin silver against the manufactured black of Bess Lomax's soundstage, they are clearly out of place, yet witnessing them in the space of Bamford's Osha Theater, where my friends and collaborators were far outnumbered by strangers and white folks, I felt completely at home. And perhaps that is the function of sacred pictures all the feeling that exceeds the frame, the affect and haptic of witnessing a cultural act familiar in its pitch towards the unseen. Layla, you up next? Yeah, <laughs> so. <laughs> um, so my portion is actually the sort of bookend to this screening series that we did at Banffa. And the last, the final screening in the series was called Black Interior Sweat. Um, and also, pardon me as I locate my videos to share with y'all. We sat together infinitely in the experience and discovery of sweat. An interior space producing exterior effects. A space our body responds to with immediacy. Sometimes out of desperation. Sometimes out of urgency for change and out of exasperation with the way things are. And so we sweat as an expression of what Carr Keeling refers to as affective labor. Which Maria Lundy Landy, excuse me, further describes as a form of labor expended in the consumption of cinematic images. A labor expended in order to produce and maintain forms of social life. Black social life. Sweat is evidence of labor. The screenings films reflect the inner worlds of Black working people, asking us to consider not only the material outcomes of their efforts, but the moments of tension, pleasure, communion, and delight that gave Black labor power its deaths. Connecting the counter dialogues of 1970s radical Black movement with political movements 
and the voices of urgency and protest. Finally got the news, which is what we see before us, transitions to scenes of black auto workers in Detroit, produced in association with the League of Revolutionary Black Workers. The documentary extends the architectural collision in scenes of Michigan's famous auto factories with the riotous ensemble of protest. Effective in identifying how bodies can sweat in conviction stand as a chilling reminder of Jack Halberstam's words in the introduction of the Undercommons, Fugitive Planning and Black Study. The call is always a call to disorder. And this disorder or wildness shows up in many places, in jazz, in improvisation, in noise. Thank you. Thank you. Jamal. Well, so my section of uh, Black Interiors was titled Intimacy, and um, it had a lot to do with like the joys of Black space and space making practices, um, and also kind of the the life giving possibilities of intimacy between Black folks. Um, or the life-giving possibilities that Blackness enacts. Um, but it was also about kind of the tortured relationship that Blackness has to domestic space and its terms, mother, father, child, um, and a lot to do with how the cinema um, tries to depict Black domestic space in ways that are sometimes problematic, um, sometimes given the filmmakers and their kind of asymmetrical power relationships to those that they're filming, but also how Blackness, when it enters the frame, does something different um, and shows these methods of love and survival that the filmmaker might not have even had in mind when they were making that film, um, and how important it is to attune ourselves to a viewing practice that accounts for that. Um, so I'm going to show um, a quick clip um, of a, a film that I think is really interesting, thinking about the space that we're in now. We're all kind of limited to our domiciles, as you're noticing um, today. And um, I'm going to talk a little bit about a uh, film, Evan's Corner. So I'm going to show that. Show a quick clip. <laughs> and then, why do you want a corner of your own? You want a chance to be lonely. Okay. So, um, a lushly filmed week in the life of a black boy, Evans Corner asks, how can we find and prioritize intimacy with ourselves? As Evan, our young protagonist, wrestles with his need for autonomy. Like the Blue Dashiki, um, an educational film screened during another um, screening titled Black Interior Sweat, the film follows an industrious black boy working hard to secure something of his own, something of his own. In this case, decorations for a corner of the apartment he shares with his parents and siblings. The corner is his mother's smart idea for giving Evan a sense of self in their quaint home. Evan wants a chance to be lonely, waste time and enjoy peace and quiet. He inevitably finds this occasionally stop motion quest for propriety and individually and, and in, for propriety and individuality limiting and leans toward communal service. It's so pertinent to, to, to right now that, that clip and that whole idea of, you know, of loneliness and a space of one's own. Yeah. I almost forgot how beautiful that moment is. Like, I know, I know. 
And it was it was very apropos, like sitting in that theater next to I think I was in the middle of both of y'all, or maybe on the end, it don't matter. But y'all are I had two Tauruses on either side of me. <laughs> oh, Taurus child. <laughs> Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> we're trying to like negotiate with like our love of having that that time alone and like being in a situation that has forced us to be alone now. So yeah, that negotiation. But still enjoying the pleasure of smelling flowers and loneliness too. It's mm-hmm. yeah, very Torian. And I feel like I might be misremembering, but doesn't his corner has a window, right? Like, doesn't mm-hmm. he like so he corner has, has this a window, window and a crack in the wall? I think or something like yeah, it, it has personality. It has personality. <laughs> it has openings. You know? mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And that's what happens. I feel like when you have like limit limitations on your space, you start to notice really minor things. Like when I've been going on hikes, the green is so vivid. And, you know, I'm noticing so much more um, about my body and, you know, the way that I'm carrying myself, like how my neck sits on my shoulders, you know, um, how something would affect me. And I'm feeling so much more in my body because of the limitations of space right now with what we're all going through. And I think because we're all going through it as well, that's something more, so much more profound. my porch the other day and I was just like sitting down drinking a smoothie or something and then I heard something I was like oh wow this tree like the wind moving in <laughs> through this tree is making music and I was like wow this is quarantine um but also deep listening you know like it's just yeah. like like when you don't when you are forced into like a low stimulation period like the kind of like natural sounds or unnatural sounds because I live in New Orleans so people be blasting stuff down the street like just everything has a different currency and feeling. Yeah, and as somebody who like finds great pleasure in getting dressed and going outside and seeing people, I th- I f- there is so much more new meaning to putting on putting clothes on every day. And I find that like even the selection process is very, <laughs> it's sometimes it's stressful. It's like. I really want to find this balance between comfort and luxury (laughs) and learning how to get dressed for myself in a way that is like just pleasing for myself. (laughs) Like, let me put on this turtleneck in these, in these fancy boots, but for no one to see me, you know, it's like, it it makes me question like our, our um, material motives and, um, I don't know, trying to find joy in, in, in fabrics that I choose to wear and, you know, ways that I find beauty in myself in solitude. Mm. Are we up for some more mixing? Yeah. Yeah. Layla, you ready? Am I ready? Yeah, am I ready? <laughs> I guess so. <laughs> really sad that I can't, um, I couldn't locate one of my favorite um, animations in the series. It was, I think it was our only animation, but Noel's Lemonade Stand. Yeah, yeah that would have been um, It's not available online, but if, if anyone can get access to it, whether it's through the Pacific Film Archive or otherwise, I really, really highly recommend that that uh, beautiful little short animation. Um, but my next my next section is going to name that along with uh, other other films that we screened that had these uh, moments similar to Evan's Corner, where these children were finding pleasure in sweat and and uh, learning what labor meant um and in the context of adolescence or pre-adolescence what what does it mean to work and um work for something other than material gain but working for happiness or working to um figure out i guess what 
what purpose your 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 life and your efforts serve and and um who those efforts are serving uh so i want to play this clip from blue dashiki <laughs> What a beautiful segue from that conversation about putting on clothes. <laughs> um, so the Kathleen Collins scripted animation, Noel's Lemonade Stand, the educational short, The Blue Dashiki, and the experimental documentary, Felicia, all considered economic collectivity, self-sufficiency, and proto-Black feminist critique. The children depicted dream of possibility in earnest despite imminent dangers. And their labor is consistent in hubris and in innocence. All three films locate the quiet cacophony to be found in children, though never dulling in the sharp edge and palpability of their political objections. I find it most relevant that we gather together in darkness to witness the permutations of Black intimacy, spirituality, and sweat, and in the most intimate of spaces, the Black imagination. It was in a movie theater where I discovered and cultivated my own interior language. I found the cinema to be a place hidden in plain sight where I could sit among other bodies, unannounced and in private. A place where unlike home, I could take a pew, but unlike church, I could take a pew and find solitude without asking permission from God. It was in a theater where I first realized the many ways black people dream, the many ways we dream in lieu of sleep. It's so beautiful seeing and um, hearing you read, you know, after seeing um, so many iterations of these essays uh, over the past few months, but then actually hearing them being read and then seeing some visuals as well accompanying them. It just really brings the words to life. Thank you. It's, Thank you. Yeah, it's beautiful. Jamal? All right. Uh <laughs> Why y'all all act shocked? <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, uh, yeah, so I'm going to um, play what was probably a clip from the most meaningful film for me that we showed. They all, they, but the one that impacted me the most, I have to admit, was um, a director John Sanborn's 1989 short film untitled um, featuring dancer Bill T. Jones. Um, so I wish I could show the whole film because I don't think there's any way to really explain it without you actually seeing it. But I'm just going to play a little bit of, of Jones dancing um, and I'll kind of try and give some description of it. But it's really a kind of like it's it's corporeal, like it's 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 embodied, it's feeling um, that really makes this film um, so magical. So I'll show a little bit. So for the closing film of that um, screening, we watched Bill T. Jones dance through the loss of his partner, Arnie Zane, and director John Sanborn's Untitled, an abstract view on intimacy with grief and the beyond. The 11 minute clip tears through the screen and grabs you by the chest. Bill T. Jones says, quote, do you remember again and again to his late partner while looking through the camera? You are a witness to Joan's belief in the beyond that he speaks to. It feels as if you are interpolated into this beyond, a testimony to the grief of the early AIDS crisis and the many souls whose presence it robbed us of. Jones here makes a special cinematic place for he and Zane's love. Its presence in dreams and memories and most importantly, movement. 
Throughout, Jones dances Zane's choreography, sometimes with the hologram of, a hologram of Zane. In the end, Jones states, looking at the camera, I think we're alone now. The impact will take you outside of yourself. Sorry, you have to follow that rule. I'm like, uh, <laughs> <laughs> I can just talk about Bill T. John some more. Uh, <laughs> there is something, and I'm going to try to remember the name of it before I get into my next piece. Um, I found this on a list of like, like mutual aid or like uh, things for like corn oh you know it was on that academic corn COVID-19 response oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. um this beautiful work that Bill T. Jones did in collaboration with chronically ill people yeah. um, like sourcing movement from the stories of people who were navigating different types of sicknesses illnesses um and it's been something that's been at the forefront of my mind in this moment is like um health the body vulnerability disability justice I um, mean, I, I think that there's like just something so like beautiful and generous and masterful in the way that Bill, D, Bill T. Jones gives his body um, mm -hmm. to those questions and concerns um, in ways that impact the body. Like, because even just watching that clip got me like in it. Um, and your beautiful narration of it like brought me back. Um, yeah. yeah. Yeah, that's another one that like, that is is sitting with me um, in this in this moment for 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 various reasons. Um, this moment of like deep grief and the kind of anxiety around massive loss, the potential of massive loss, um, and yeah, and uh, yeah, the worries about that for Black and Brown and poor folk. Um, and how Bill T. Jones has used his his corpus, like his work, to um, to lay lay a ground for that, um, in oftentimes in in oftentimes controversial ways. Um, that, but he's been quite the he's been quite brave, um, and the work is just always beautiful. So yeah. Um, well, I guess this is a, a apt time to talk spirit, you know, like I think that makes sense. Um, so I want to show a clip from um, a film we showed by the experimental documentary filmmaker Lynn Sachs called Sermons and Sacred Pic Pictures, um, in which um, Sachs has, has basically gone through this archive of footage, I believe from the 30s and 40s by this black preacher in Memphis um, named Reverend L.O. Taylor. And in the clip that I'll show, you'll see a screening of that footage in Memphis today. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about that and then I'll try to speak um, or to call in um, Reverend Marvin K. White, who was our respondent that evening of that screening. Um, and just a little bit of the texture of that happening. Photography and minister, there's, there's no, you don't have to mix it to at all. I mean, there's no reason to. But because of his love for photography, he didn't just take pictures, but he used his work as, as photography and filmmaking to make a social statement. It's a social statement what he did, because it was like a tale of two cities there. Spirit is black radical energy. Spirit resides in and beyond the structure of the church. And for black folks, 
Church is a room full of laughter and loud stomps of community and Sunday best, of good gospel and good gossip. In Lynn Sachs' sermons and sacred pictures, we are introduced to the work of Reverend L.O. Taylor, who captured the essence of Black church in a series of recordings from the 1930s and 40s. An early 20th century Black preacher's archive being entered and reinterpreted by a white woman filmmaker in the late 80s is a transgression of both time and the cultural sanctities of the color line. Reverend Taylor's film footage and Lynn Sachs' contemporary arrangement of it gives us a grammar for the appraisal of sacred pictures. The term sacred pictures in and of itself sounds like the way somebody's black grandma talks about both her precious family photos and the images of white Jesus looming over her living quarters. Mm -hmm. In this speculative anecdote, the sacred is both deeply familiar and holy in its foreignness. In the Black Woman segment of the 1970s television program, Black Journal, from which we excerpted a Nikki Giovanni poem, there's a section devoted to a Black church in Detroit called the Shrine of the Black Madonna. Here, there is no white Jesus, and the most sacred picture is that of an ebony Black woman and her child. Following the political and cultural mandates of the time, Black spirituality, black spirituality looks radically different in the 1970s than it does through Reverend Taylor's 1930s lens. Reverend Marvin K. White is a poet, artist, teacher, and preacher who offers in his writings, sermons, and general presence a reflection of God's perfect love and Black Jesus's perfect smile. He joined us on stage the night of the Black Interior Spirit Program in a t-shirt featuring the cover art from the 1991 first edition of Brother to Brother, new writing by Black gay men, edited by Essex Hemphill. This sartorial choice, the Black gay preacher dressed in the words of his deceased forebearers, is a ring shot of its own, a ring shout of its own. We could say that Marvin has a habit of coming around in queer ways. It was the last week of Black History Month when we gathered to tend to each other in front of a large and mostly anonymous audience. There was laughter, there was bibliomancy. A white woman was invited to face her feelings of alienation and in a frenzy of emotion, proclaimed her love for Africa in a fit of tears and then stormed out. <laughs> And it just, I would just stop there because <laughs> I got distracted by the memory. Um, that did. Yeah, that did happen in real life. I don't know how to make my screen stop being shared. We'll go up to that top. Yeah. Oh, you know what? It was behind y'all. Okay. <laughs> Not a bad place to be. Yeah. True. Listening to you all um, speak makes me think about what you call, Layla, the living assembly when you speak about the collective. I wondered if you could speak more about that on the fly. Um, just what I mean by the living assembly? Yeah, it just it just it it just feels like so much is evoked by I mean obviously the book is this like I've mentioned is it's a tract to um you know this past year that you've been working on and showing these visuals of these incredible films and <clears throat> digging so deeply into black American life and then but then actually hearing you speak these words I don't know, it's just something, it just evokes so much, you know, and it just makes me think about what you mentioned about the Living Assembly. I wonder if you could speak about it. Yeah, I mean, I feel like I have to speak about it in a, in a new context and considering um, that we can't actually assemble in the ways that we were able to previously because we're obviously all in quarantine. Um, but in this moment when we aren't, when we aren't able to be 
physically present, the contours of, of our interior spaces are infinite and, and boundless. Uh, and I mean, it's something that I, at least especially in this moment, I'm referring to as the virtual black hole. Um, that's, that's this like black aesthetic assembly that we've created in this virtual space. Um, it's, it's a black hole that we still collectively manage to pull together um, and create this content in the spirit of our, our virtual communities. Um, and we've, assemb we've assembled to reach everyone in this, in this moment of loneliness and, and solitude and exile and refuge, however you want to define this, this moment. Um, and I think in the spirit of that assembly, I wanna invite everyone listening to help us define the aesthetics of this virtual black hole. Um, and through this new publication, um, and I think the black aesthetic being the four of us because we are holding this moment uh, collectively, uh, we are, we're attempting and hopefully successfully so to reach deep within and far beyond this black hole to reach the rest of you, um, to redefine, to reassess, to reactualize these black aesthetics within this this new limitation. Uh, so, how I'm thinking about assembly now is finding ways for all of us to reach within and beyond. Yeah, I don't know if that answers your question, but I'm in my feelings right yeah. now. Yeah, <laughs> even more answered it and beyond. Thank you. Yeah, repurposing our our old language completely. That's also making me think of, um, or I think the kind of assembly work that goes into like corralling all the different voices that make up each publication. You know, like. Mm -hmm inviting folks to speak from their own position within the black hole like i'm trying to jump inside your metaphor um but i feel like we put this call out that's really just asking for people um to just to describe their their position in relationship to the black hole that is like black representational strategies or the idea of black art in the collective um and then we assemble um those voices and, and reports and, and perspectives and art and poetry and whatever and images um, into another offering, um, which is what we have in the publication. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think um, one of the things that's really interesting, and I'm not going to act like I know space or like that, you know, like, <laughs> I don't here, but like you know I'm just I'm really that's a really provocative like metaphor the black hole um, and I think one of the things that's lost maybe in like this black hole is like this moment of pause where we're in this moment where we don't know what the end of it is and we don't know like what it is to be out of it, to to get out of it um, and also kind of like um, the ways that, and it's also making me think of like the ways that blackness is in and of itself like already elaborates this this kind of constitution of being so so wedded to and um, sutured to the beyond, um, to mourning, um, to to the other side of life, um, and how we've now been put in these spaces that are, 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 are smaller, are more compact, that are making us have to work with what we have, um, and how that has always been a part of Black aesthetic possibility about, like, about with, with what we have, um, and how so many of our contributors um, are really, uh, these are really, uh, many of them are really intimate um, contributions. Many of our contributions are very intimate in the publication. And I think that they're really, really speaking to this moment of, of thinking of, of Black interiors, of Black intimacy as the space of possibility. Um, what is it to kind of get past or um, 
add on to or further elaborate the theoretical from the space of the in the interior of deep thought of complicated thought from from your own home space um, from your own um, uh, emotionality so yeah I think that that's one of the the strengths of the publication for sure mm -hmm. and I think sorry go Leila I, I, I kind of want to hear the same from you, Nan. Um, what is it like to jump into a space where, um, you know, this collective, creative collective is already so familiar with each other's language and to somehow assemble, have to assemble our language together, the contributors and the existing members to create new meaning? Like, what was that like for you? I think that it was already... I mean, it, it acted as a vessel by itself already. It was already its own thing. And so that that part of it was was quite straightforward because it, it was kind of, it, it felt like it was its own force already. And there were these kind of, these moving pieces and some of them, you know, remember weren't so, so much part of, um, the whole, and so they had to kind of move away. Um, but generally, everything was fitting together like a puzzle. Um, and I think the language, I think that you've all been so open and so um, um, not, uh, not like, but, you know, mutative and so mutable that it's been quite a straightforward process coming in as an editor and working with you um, as a collective to to edit this this um, you know everybody else's contributions and and your own I think that your ideas of you know strategizing in that way of thinking in terms of black life in those different ways of intimacy of sweat and of um, yeah. so, yes um, that, that having those those themes really helped as well in terms of the other contributions but also in terms of your 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 writing as well um but the one the one thing that i had a problem with was what was writing an introduction that that could kind of pick up on other people's writing you know so i did write several introductions as you know and it did take me a while but i i, I got it eventually <laughs> Um, <laughs> yeah, I made it. <laughs> yeah. I just uh, want to call in and shout out the names of the contributors right quick. Yeah, let's do that. It's time for that. We got uh, our very own Jamal Bass. Woo woo. Woo. And Colin Moore, our lovely editor Weaver. Um, Michael Boyce Gillespie. Rob Malika and Montez, that's me. Um, the photography of Sasha Kelly, who was actually our like commissioned photographer for season three. Um, Michelle May Curry, Lee Rafer, Renee Royale, See mm. Black Women, which is an initiative out of the Bay Area. Um, Ricky Weaver, Layla Weafue, and the poet Arissa White. Um, on top of like a series of really amazing filmmakers, most of whom were based in California um, during the time of the TBA season three. Um, and yeah, so just like- Can we give a preview of the, of the photos? Yeah. Yeah, we should also say a shout out to, to um, Justin and to Jacob from Wolfman oh. Books as well, who really have been a big support. Absolutely, just the beginning, like from- Yeah. 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 If and when, because I know you will purchase the book, uh, you will see the history of of all of us finding each other and finding ourselves in Wolfman and um, you know building community in that space. Uh, so Wolfman has been a great deal, has meant a great deal to all of us from the beginning to even now to be able to publish this book. Uh. Malika, it seems that for some reason you're like the black, the clip. Oh, that's me. That's me. Because <laughs> <laughs> um, um, the black women, the black
black woman was playing, so I thought it was like still your screen, but it's my screen. Yeah. Is this the one that you're all going to riff off of, or? Um, I'm going. Here we go. I was going to to show the um the the some of the yeah the photos from the Black Aesthetic um, season three. This so is preview. I love this photo. Yeah, that's a one. So these are all by Sasha Kelly, Bay Area based. A photographer, artist, um, and this is a screening we did at Spirit House Gallery in Oakland. Um, shout out to Picasso, um, and this is Numa Perrier, um, who actually um, did a first screening of a preview of her film Jezebel, which is now been widely released and well reviewed. Um, so she did a. a small screening of that and also show Florida water and some other shorts. So. And we include these photographs just to give those who aren't able to attend our screenings just some idea of what it's like to, to be there and, and to witness these moments where we're all gathering and watching and staring at a screen and having conversation and arguing. Uh, <laughs> Look at all this tech. <laughs> yeah yeah and I think uh what Nan was speaking about earlier about how um and this is Alima Lee's screening of her shorts um and I think one of the things that um Nan was talking about was how it becomes like this really important space of community um a lot of like the the, the folks that we're friends with now um, the folks that we find ourselves in community with um, actually came from this desire to like watch like black cinema together. Um, this has been a really beautiful experience. And Sasha blessed us with so many photos. We have like hundreds of photos, I think, and we had to pare it down um, and select, make very specific selections to be included in the book. And some of these photos, I remember us looking at them together and we, we, there were some that were really difficult to let go of, but some that we knew we had to keep, like these moments where people are buying food or, you know, a couple that, you know, we don't really even remember the names of are hugging. And Sasha Kelly was so inspired that she had to, you know what I'm saying, capture this moment of Black love. Yeah. Jazzy, come on. BT Dance. Oh, come on. Come on. Come on. <laughs> Uh, and that's Benjamin filming Benjamin Michelle. Shout all, uh, all the love, Shanoa, who wrote well, for who contributed to our previous book. Yeah. And this is Anicio Uzeman's screening of Dream State. Notice Jamal and Malika's foot pointing outwards. <laughs> Framing the photograph for us all. <laughs> and there's uh, Anicia and Saul Williams in conversation with Zoe Smoothie. Christian Johnson, um, who is one of the um, OG co-founders of the Black Aesthetic, and we got a chance to screen um, his fir first um, short film at uh, the Berkeley Art Museum and Pacific Film Archive, which was like a really well-attended screening. Like so many people were there. Um, lots of really, you know, fired up conversation. Yeah, yes. The really? <laughs> all Black representation. We also screened The Dutchman. Um, like the film adaptation of the Amiri Baraka play. And it was, so it was like, it was, it was on fire. Look at all those people. <laughs> Summer and Imogen being cute in the front. People had to stay, you know, folks had to stand up. They came yeah. through. All right. Okay, we won't give too much. No one give too much, but yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Sasha, for listening. For yes. photographing these evenings for us. I'm a, I'm cognizant of time right now, y'all. I know, man, <laughs> we can edit this out, but Nan has somewhere to be. 
in a little bit. Um, so I'm wondering what we want to do with kind of like yeah. our yeah. Uh, we said uh, we oh did. yeah. You just shared that, right? Like the like the Wolfman thing, right? Mm -hmm. uh, okay. So if you were wondering where to buy the book, Jamal will sure. pull up the screen. Okay, I'm working here, y'all. Here we go. Wolfmanhomerepair.com slash books. That's book. This first thing to pop up. If not, look for that hand holding cotton. <laughs> and that beautiful image by um, Wilson. native artist Andrew Wilson, who's so oh. dope and so talented. Um, it's like, oh, look at it. How beautiful is that? Gorgeous. Gorgeous. Look at that. <laughs> it's beautiful. You have, you have to have yours. Uh, WolfmanHomeRepair.com slash books, Black Interior Season 3, Black Interior, Black Aesthetic Season 3, Black Interiors, edited by Nan Collie Moore by the Black Aesthetic Collective, is out now. Don't miss out. Yes, don't miss out. Doors. Yeah. Like, I mean, really don't miss out, because the last two books. They sell out quickly, wow. so you know. Yeah, period. Um, <laughs> sell out. So, like, you might want to, like, hit that button now. Um, <laughs> Don't already um, follow the Black Aesthetic on like social media. I think we're like at the the Black or at the BLK Aesthetic. It's at scroll down a little bit, Jamal. BLK underscore right. At B underscore B L A C K Aesthetic. Um, because we'll be doing we're planning like a series of really dope like virtual book tour happenings. You'll get to hear a little bit more from the contributors and the filmmakers from season three. Um, and I think it's just going to be really uh, an exciting attempt or experiment at how you like assemble um, in, in these current conditions. In the virtual black hole. In the virtual black hole. Exactly. Thank you. <laughs> this, is, this is great. So we should say thank you to Printed Matter. Thank you to everyone at Printed Matter. Printed Matter for us in the video. Um, and letting us, you know, um, do this since uh, the LA Art Book Fair was canceled. We really do appreciate that. Uh, this is a wonderful experience. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I could play us out with a little something. You know? Yeah, that would be great, Jamal. Wait, but um, stop the screen share so they can see us. Oh, yeah. yeah stop. Oh, yeah, we might want to do that. Okay. Okay, okay. yeah. Thank y'all for still watching. <laughs> <laughs> Real one, if you still tune in, you probably see some dancing. Cause yeah. yeah, can we take a moment to appreciate our hair, y'all? Yes, pretty good. Yes, pretty good. Yeah. <laughs> Raw, you're so good. Come into my ledger, the spiritual bond.